Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Keenan's Cutting Edge. My name is Jenna Labor, and I will be your host as we explore the dynamic world of Don Keenan's trial philosophy, The Cutting Edge. Those of you joining us live this afternoon already know that you have the opportunity to interact with our speaker and ask questions. If you want to do that, please make sure to type your question in the comment section below so that we can address it. If you're unable to spend a live hour with us today, however, episodes are released each week following the live broadcast. So be sure to hit that like and subscribe button and click the alerts icon to make sure you don't miss an episode. Today, we have Ronald Brodkin with us to talk about digital motion x-ray. Dr. Brodkin practices, excuse me, chiropractic medicine in Boca Raton, Florida. We will put his contact information in the description below so that you can reach out to him directly after this episode if you have any questions on this topic. In addition to his chiropractic degree, Dr. Brodkin completed postgraduate neurological training and is board certified in chiropractic neurology. He also has a subspecialty training in electrodiagnosis. Dr. Brodkin uses digital motion x-ray in his practice to educate his patients about their injuries. This same education can be a huge resource for personal injury lawyers looking to help insurance companies, defense counsel, juries, and judges better understand these kind of so-called soft tissue or musculoskeletal injuries that many of us encounter in our practices. One of the best ways and really the only way to be effective in trying a case where your client largely has these kind of invisible or musculoskeletal injuries is to have some objective way of showing them. They're not minor injuries, but seeing is believing, right? So Dr. Brodkin, please share with us what digital motion x-ray is and how it can help patients and clients. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for inviting me. And hopefully I take you on a nice journey into understanding uh, functional injuries and how these are the types of injuries that are painful and cannot be faked. They're either there or they're not there. Uh, and uh, as we kind of progress through the types of injuries and through digital motion x-ray, uh, I'll be able to share with you how you visualize uh, when a person says, uh, I have got involved in a car accident and I sustained whiplash. Or on my side, where besides seeing whiplash patients, I have a family practice and I see a lot of um, sports related injuries. Uh, so I'll have some, a football player who's uh, got a bad hit or a soccer player that suddenly we don't understand why they're, they're hurting. And I'll be able to kind of show you uh, what it really looks like. Uh, and so with no further ado, if you guys want, I'm ready to get right into it. Absolutely. Let's check it out. Uh, hit share screen. Go ahead. All right. And make sure to hit that optimize button so we can see the videos. There. Uh, let's see. Looking good, I can see it. You can see it? Yeah. All right, now, digital motion x-ray uh, is an objective way of visualizing an alteration of motion segment integrity. Uh, motion segment integrity is the way they'll describe uh, injuries within the AMA Guides to Impairment 6th edition. Uh, so I'm using that to um, kind of highlight what they're talking about, what it means by motion segment integrity. And when you have a whiplash injury, how you actually lose motion segment integrity because of what goes on. Here's a cervical spine. We have a big reversal in the, in the curve. We have a bunch of arthritic changes, but we don't know if it's unstable. We don't know if it really has an injury. Uh, we just know somebody's complaining of pain. When we take this x-ray from a static perspective, and then we give it life, and life would look like this. If you take a look now, 
right here, you have damage in the posterior longitudinal ligament. And how's it functioning? Well, if I get it moving and then I take it backwards, it almost lines up again. If I take it forwards, I show the instability. There's the damage in that posterior longitudinal ligament. There's the, what they call anterior translation in C3 over C4. This is an indication of injury to the, what they call the posterior longitudinal ligament. Now, this is, becomes painful. It becomes unstable. Uh, there, in this particular case, there wasn't a lot of disc injury, and the pain was pretty much coming from the damage within the posterior longitudinal ligament. So we're looking at the instability here and we realize that this ligament back here is innervated with sensory nerve. Sensory nerves are what gives you pain. So we have damage to the ligament, we have irritation to the sensory nerve, we have a trigger of pain. Now the, the nerves that are involved here, we'll get into a little bit of that as we kind of progress through the uh, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, but these are the things that become very, very problematic uh, in a, a situation where everybody's looking for a disc injury. And this isn't a person who had pain radiating down their arms. The pain was in their neck and kind of going to what the area of what people would call their shoulders, which is really their upper trapezius region. Uh, and that's where it's radiating to or referring pain to. Big difference between radiation and referral of pain. This was creating a referral process. So as we take a look, she goes here and the instability. This was a posterior longitudinal ligament injury. Now, as we progress along, interesting study. This was a whiplash case. And we know we have a lot of degenerative changes right in here. You see how the disc is all degenerated. You have a bunch of bone spurs. We have a change in the curve. And we have just somebody who's complaining of pain. Once again, not a lot of disc problem here. But what we did look at is if you were an IME doctor, uh, what I want you to observe is the motion and pretend you can't see these bones and just see this is the person who's moving. So if I just look at motion in the spine and look at my little person here, she bends all the way down and she goes all the way back. Now, if you were an independent medical examiner, you turn around and say, well, that's normal range of motion. Must be okay. Well, as a matter of fact, it's not because she's hypermobile. And when she goes forward, there's the anterior translation, some ligament damage right here again in the posterior large to the ligament. So what you have is not a loss of motion we have too much motion. So actually we have hypermobility. Hypermobility is what uh, is referred to as ligament laxity. And that is what they refer to as an alteration of motion segment integrity. So once again, we have a damage in the posterior longitudinal ligament. Now you gotta remember the ligament, once again, is invaded by nerve that comes out of the spinal column and innervates the ligament. And your innervation to your ligaments uh, often comes from a branch called the sinus vertebral nerve, uh, which will also innervate the disc. So you get irritation there and you can get a complex of two pain generators, a ligament and a little stretching on the disc because this ligament, the posterior longitudinal ligament, attaches to the disc. So if you damage the ligament, now you're gonna put a little bit of a, an irritation into the disc. So if we look at her now, she moves fine, but there's damage in here. But visually, if you're just uh, looking at her range of motion, 
as just an examiner. If I was just examining her and not had a chance to look at this motion study, my first response was, well, she has full range of motion and flexion. And as I'm watching her visually, she has full range of motion and extension. But we know that it's abnormal motion because we can see it when we look at the motion x-ray. So she goes forward, she's hypermobile in through here. She goes backwards, and what she ends up doing is if you watch right in here, this, this space will open up. As this opens up in here, the anterior longitudinal ligament has also been stretched out. So we end up with posterior longitudinal ligament uh, injury and an anterior longitudinal ligament injury, uh, causing what is really a little bit of instability that visually looks like normal range of motion. It's actually hypermobile, but we only know the hypermobility because we can see it on digital motion x-ray. So as an examiner, if you're just looking at it, or you're just looking at a static film, you're not going to be able to see. Only thing you see on a static film is this. It looks like I have a little reversal in the curve and arthritic changes. But if there's arthritic changes, there should be no ligament damage. If anything, you would anticipate a loss of motion in here where it actually wouldn't move very much if I was just going clinically and saying, okay, I got a bunch of authority changes in a person's neck. I expect to see hypo, loss of motion. And in this case, we have hyper, too much motion. Only way we know this is digital motion x-ray. I'm moving down the pipe here, which is real interesting. Now, once again, uh, this, this is a whiplash case, and we're looking at it, did not have any uh, disc injuries, but had neck pain. So when looking at it, you know, his curve's not so bad. There's a, you know, cervical lordotic curve. It kind of reverses a little bit as we get a little lower. Here's one, two, three, four, five. And then kind of in six, seven, it's a little bit, looks like it's kind of gone a little uh, lordotic. I should say high five. So, when we put him in di digital motion x-ray, I was curious what was going on, why he's complaining of pain. And what you're going to see, and we'll highlight it, is this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, six. This is six, seven. Now, this is the spinous process of seven, this is six. There's a ligament that's supposed to hold these two uh, bones together. The spinous process is called the inner spinous ligament. Well, the inner spinous ligament in this case has been stretched out. So it's lost the integrity of the ligament and it, it's become hypermobile. Now, the ligament only has an elastic zone. It can only stretch so much to go back to its original integrity. Once you exceed its elastic zone, it's not going back to original um, elasticity and then will stay elongated. So when we look at it, we're going to see, as you, now when I show you, when he starts going back, this is going to close. Now when he comes back forward, I want everybody to watch. And you're going to see, suddenly, this is going to gap open. It's going to go backwards. This all closes down. And now when he starts coming forwards, this is starting to open up. Starting to open up even more and even more. And the nice part about the motion x ray, it's not like a static film where it's just you can only take a picture at the end range of the flexion or extension to look at things. You don't see it in motion. So I can show the ligament as it's starting to gap open. And here it gaps with uh, 67. Okay, now you're going to watch him to let it play through. He's going to go backwards, goes forwards. Now you see the gap. He goes back. I'm going to let everybody watch it. He closes down. And watch it here. It's going to gap. Boom. 
right over, right in through there. That is, once again, hypermobility. And the uh, ligament, once again, is innovated with uh, pain receptors, sensory nerves. So you end up with pain and you end up with a feeling of like, my neck is always tight. Well, your ligaments are the first line of control over your bones. And if a ligament gets damaged, well, the muscles want to fill in the gap where that they have to give support because the ligament isn't giving you all the support it's supposed to. So the muscle stays, stays chronically tight because it's always working to create stability. Moving down the road. So once again, we're looking at um, some ligament damage. Now, we're going to look at the capsule ligaments. This was an interesting case. This one actually went to trial. And I think the attorney came back with a very nice settlement on this particular case. And the only thing we had on this particular case was a negative MRI and positive digital motion x-ray. And the digital motion x-ray show the capsule ligament where you're going to see left and right sides in comparison, and you're going to be able to see where the ligament damage is. I'm going to play it through, and you're almost going to be able to become your own radiologist when you look at this. The observation is right in here. This is the foramen. This is two, three, three, four, and four, five, and five, six. Now there's an encroachment right in here where this should look like this and this. And when she goes into extension, there's foraminal encroachment. We're looking at her right side. It closes down. And as she repeats it, and she can't even get the good muscle guarding that goes along with it, she gets more encroachment uh, in this area because of the capsule ligament damage. And there's the encroachment. Oh, I lost it. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'm getting a lot of feedback on that video, so I can't hear you. I can only hear kind of, I don't know if anybody else is getting that. Yeah, I'm getting on my side too. Okay. Um, it's only on that video. So far, everything else has been super great. Okay. I'm going to just, I'm going to fast forward through it so people can kind of see what I'm looking at. Okay. So you've seen this on the right, and I'm going to, I'm going to manually run through it so we don't get feedback. Here's our left side. Is better. And as she goes flexion and when she goes extension, notice the foramen are all maintained. There's no encroachment. As she continues to go forward, this is her left side. And backwards, there, there's no foraminal encroachment. She goes forward, it's open. She goes backwards, it's closed. Now, I'm going to play her right side over again. Now you can play radiologist. She goes backwards. Here's the encroachment. And she continues to go forwards. Then she comes back, forward, and back. There's the encroachment. Encroachment, capsule ligament damage, preventing causing this part of the facet to glide up into the foraminal space. And as we're gonna fast forward and go to her left side and it's not there. When she goes backwards, there's no foraminal encroachment. So she had capsule ligament injury, she had chronic neck pain, but no herniations. Um, this uh, we wanted uh, in trial. 
Uh, I forget how long it took to go to trial with this, but it was like forever. It takes so long. It's amazing. Uh, Dr. Rockin, we have a question from the audience. Sure. And let's see, this audience member asks, Dr. Bradkin, I am interested in knowing whether you're seeing a lot of ALAR damage or significant atlas lateral shifts in open mouth side bending views on the DMX. Tell us why those views are important. Yes, I am. And um, I'm kind of working my way into those views and I'll show you what it looks like. I'll show you what normal looks like and I'll show you what uh, bilateral uh, injury looks like for ALAR and, and accessory ligaments. And I'll show you what it looks like from unilateral side. Awesome. And, well, stay tuned then. <laughs> yeah. So we'll get a chance to actually look at the injury and progress to bilateral and what it looks like for unilateral. So you can see it visually and you'll understand why person can't fake this. It's either there or it's not there. And once it's there, it's pretty much going to stay there. And you, you hope they don't get into another wreck and make it worse. Uh, so this is real interesting. This was another uh, uh, car wreck. This, and she ended up with what they call an anterior longitudinal ligament injury. Now, I'm going to let you guys play radiologist on this for a moment. And you'll appreciate it. Just keep your eyes up through here. Well, I'm going to let you think about it. This is slip backwards. So what happens is you have an ALL, anterior longitudinal ligament injury at one, two, at three, four. This has gone posterior. And when she goes forward, it actually corrects. So it's unstable. When she goes backwards, you're starting to move. We're just making movement, movement. It's getting worse. It's getting a little worse. And as she moves forward, it corrects. When she goes backwards, she ooh, come on. Forward. For some reason, they want to show a bunch of other things. I got a bunch of really cool slides. As we go through here, hopefully we have some time. I think there are some things that um, you don't often see. I, I have a pretty neat library of motion studies because uh, I've been doing it for so many years. And there's one um, I'm actually doing this week of um, actual uh, hip that's literally dislocating. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like a physical exam. You feel the head of the finger popping out. And uh, I just didn't get a chance to do it this week. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, just office hours, just, it was tough. So we're going to try and do it next week. Um, because it's an unusual one. I have one other that we actually used um, a long time ago. And uh, this one's just much more, this, I think this is going to be incredibly graphic because you can feel it under your hand. So I'm dying to look like, and see what it looks like on motion. So here we have ALL. Okay, I'm going to move through because I think to get to the question of your uh, ALR ligaments. Uh, this is um, C1, C2 normal. I had a volunteer, and it was very nice to a volunteer. And if you take a look, one, two, they stay in alignment when you move it. And one, two, when you go to the side, everything stays in nice alignment. And he has nice motion in here. I have him moving a couple of times to see, well, does anything shift? He stays in alignment. This is a tough picture to get because it's hard to keep your head in good position. So he was totally, totally normal. Uh, then we're getting somebody who's abnormal, but I don't want him in here. So I'm going to take you to the next one. Now, this is going to be hypermobile. Uh, and you're going to now see this is C1. This is C2. Okay, this is the left side. This is the right side. Now, I'm going to let you play radiologist. We saw normal, and these, this one and two stay pretty much in alignment, give or take a, a millimeter or so. 
Okay, so as I go like this, all right, you're all becoming radiologists now or chiropractic radiologists. Now, take a look. From here to here, you see her slip off going to the left. Now, when she goes to the right, Little bit of slip, but not much. When she, whoop, word. Ah, oh, come on. Okay. Sorry about that. She goes this way. She's pretty good. And she goes to the left. She slides off. There's a lot of ligament, a little accessory ligament damage because she has lateral translation of C1 on C2. And that's what we're visualizing. And when she starts coming back to neutral, straightens out, she goes to the other side. She had a little bit of translation. She goes to this side. Get a little bit more and she'll go and then it'll pop back. So if I don't have it moving, because she's going to go and she doesn't like being in that position because it hurts. So you're going to bring your, your neck out of that position. So when I'm doing these studies, I ask people to kind of push into the pain for me. And what happens is they'll bounce because they just don't like that position. Um, so it becomes a little difficult. So when you see the translation and then suddenly you see a shift, well, they're, they're shifting because they're, they're pain. They just do not like that. And when we go through here, we're going to see, oh, lost a little bit of my... Here, now we're going to get... Hypermobile right in here. One on two. You see how far one has gone over two? And then when you go the other way, it's going to be a little hypermobile on this side too. It's bilateral. This is about as clear and pretty as your picture as you're going to get. This is C1. This is C2. This tip here should be pretty close to this. And this is uh, instability of C1 on C2. Uh, and when he starts coming back, it corrects. There's one and two. They're lining up. Starts heading towards the left side. He's twisting his head because he doesn't like it. Now I have to ask him to turn. He's not quite as hypermobile when he goes to this side, although his head's going just as far. So when he goes to the right, he has hypermobility, predominantly it's unilateral. And if you look, this is a lot of motion in the person's neck, and he's still lined up, as opposed to when he goes to the other side. He's all the way off the plateau. So this is unilateral C1, C2 hypermobility uh, in this right side. So get the alar and accessory ligaments. So that's where we're looking at. Um, we can compare right to left. He you know, translates a little bit on the left, but nothing like on that right side. So this is where you have the C1, C2 injury. And you got to remember, this is how far he's translating. This is one, this, and this is two. These should be pretty close to a line. There's a big gap in here. Uh, that's not, I didn't do any measurements on here, but we have quite a few millimeters uh, on here uh, of instability. We know that you left to right, you should be somewhat symmetrical. Uh, similar when we do EMGs, which I do a lot of, uh, you always compare left to right side, because although you have your normative data to say, okay, this is within normal ranges, if you're in the world of EMG, if your left side, whatever the finding is, 50% different than your right side, but yet you're still within the, the normal lab findings, it's abnormal because left and right side should be somewhat symmetrical. Okay, now I'm going to kind of move down the road here. 
This is, uh, unfortunately, I lost a little bit. Okay. This is a person who had cervical surgery. Obviously, here's your plate. And he had a tough time swallowing. So you got your esophagus, you got your, your trachea here. So when he's moving, this plate is shifted away from uh, the vertebra. So when he's moving, uh, for some reason, this one's noisy too. So I'm going to move it manually. So he's coming down and he goes back. If he goes backwards, this compression within the esophagus uh, going towards the pharynx, trachea, goes forward. There's also a shift forward. So he's having trouble swallowing because of a little bit of compression in there because of uh, the way the, um, the, the fusion is. The fusion has what we kind of surmised was the fusion was just pulling away a little too far from the vertebral body. And when we're looking at it, what we were looking to see whether the actual fusion was moving. In this case, the fusion really wasn't moving, but it was definitely every time he moved his head and we're looking at it, he's just saying, I, you know, as he's moving, he's having trouble swallowing. So uh, I'm not sure what the eventual outcome was with surgeon does. I think they uh, ended up fixing this fusion. Uh, then we're going to kind of migrate down to, I don't know if you've, anybody's had a chance to uh, see some um, anterior and posterior uh, fusions uh, and how they move, but this was an interesting case. Um, comp complaining of neck pain and um, static film, this is what you see. This is pretty, this is a neutral lateral. And this one kind of got my eyes open. So when we look at this, here's the anterior plate, here's the posterior plate. Shall I say, not a really happy camper because uh, a little bit of chronic pain. But then we start moving. I'm sorry about, I don't know why we're getting all this noise. So I'm going to move it manually so we don't get the noise, but you'll be able to see it. And as we're moving, Keep your eyes open to right about here. See this little thing right here that we didn't see on the, the one neutral lateral, but watch what happens. It's moving around. There slides. And there it goes again. Right in here, there was a loose part, and uh, we weren't sure exactly what it was. Where I didn't know where it was from. I just showed it to the surgeon and just left it to to him and say, "Well, I'm only the messenger, and I don't know why you have something that's moving around in here, right here, shifting. I'm going to give you some noise, but I want you to see it." Real time. I'm sorry about the noise, but uh, you were able to see this, this particular piece that was moving around as the person was moving their neck. You don't see that unless there's motion. The only thing you see is on the static film, there's nothing moving. Um, not sure exactly what was done by the surgeon, but I just sent this back and said, okay, this is what I see. But once again, I'm only the messenger in, in this one and kind of have to decide what you're gonna do from there. So from there, we're going to go to here. And this is just kind of chronic neck pain. I'm going to let it play through and let you going to see, just so you can see what it looks like uh, visually after somebody's had uh, some anterior fusions and screws and plates. And uh, I'm sorry about the, the noise from the video, uh, but I'm not sure what's causing that. Uh, but I'm going to play it through and let you just look at it, and then I'll comment afterwards.
what you're looking at is a true alteration of motion segment integrity. Uh, he can't move. He's just in pain. Uh, and uh, the way everything is set up in here, uh, where there is hypermobility, he's hypermobile, but yet is still getting pain from probably the facets. Uh, and I think they ended up going in there and doing a posterior. Uh, but that's what we're looking at because we're, we're just curious if there's any uh, loss of um, function where anything was loose anteriorly. And I'm going to play it again so you can look at it. He just can't move. So the question becomes, what's driving the pain? Uh, and there kind of no real good answer other than the fact that you altered anteriorly the anterior longitudinal ligament, and you also have uh, the commissure, which are, is your sympathetic commissure, which is your sympathetic nervous system. So the things that create an autonomic response, uh, like um, kind of reflex sympathetic dystrophy uh, is affecting the sympathetic plexus. And you're going to have an impact here with all this stuff. So my suspicion was uh, there's just you're getting autonomic changes, which are uh, amplifying pain. But that was my neurological. That's my, that's my, uh, that's being a chiropractic neurologist putting uh, function together. Whoops. Uh, I don't want you to see this yet. Those are like my, specialty ones that I'm going to share with you. Okay, I'm going to kind of move down the road here. Let's see which one is this? That was that. Now, this is a really cool study. Okay, now, this was an elbow study that was sent to me by um, one of the uh, uh, orthos who I work with. And uh, he had done this guy in the emergency room. Oh, I forget how long ago. It must have been a couple of months uh, where he had broken, I think it was his uh, radius and ulnar, and he had a plate in here, his big plate in here, going through physical therapy. And whatever they were doing, he couldn't straighten his elbow. So they're trying, they're working it, they're working it, they're working it. So he just got to this point and said, you know, let's do a motion study. Let's see what's, whether there's something going on here. So in the beginning of the study, I didn't see a lot. But as we progress through the study, and I'm hoping there's not a lot of noise through here, and if there is, I'm going to play it through and then comment. Uh, but what we're going to look at is here. We're going to look through what would have been at one point a normal flexion of the elbow, which is the way you normally take it, uh, an x-ray, a static x-ray. And then as we go into hyperflexion and motion. So we're just going to watch this. And if we don't have noise, I will talk about it. Okay, I'm going to let you watch it, and I'm going to comment afterwards. Keep your eye up here. Okay, when we go flex the elbow, looks pretty good. Here's the end of the plate. Here's your uh, olecranol fossa. Okay. He's in full flexion now, which would be the way you normally take an, uh, an x-ray of the elbow. I don't see anything. Here's the plate. Everything looks like he did a beautiful job plating this thing. Um, and he bends a little bit more, bends a little bit more, bends a little more. Still didn't see much. Now we're going through another thing, different angle. And I saw something popping out. Now, I'm going to stop it, and I'll show you what we found. Little bone fragment sitting inside the joint that when I had him through hyperflexion and moving, it showed its, its ugly little head in here. And as we kept moving...
is again. So what happens is it kind of worked as a door wedge. So when he's trying to straighten his elbow, you got this little fragment that's sitting in, in the, the in the joint, just preventing it from straightening out. It, I, at first, I thought it was the, the end of a plate that could be going to the fossa, but I think we suspected that it was a little fragment. I'm oh, seeing that yet. Okay. So this was, um, I think he ended up going in and because um, he felt that everything had healed really well. I think he removed the plate, go in and take that fragment out. But uh, that I don't, uh, don't know the end of that. Um, now I'm going to show you um, kind of my last slide and then you know, I'll open up to everybody if you have any questions for me. Uh, this was um, this is a patient of mine. And uh, he had a really bad uh, bicycle accident. Uh, prior to the bicycle accident, um, what a tremendous athlete. Uh, and I'll give you a little history. I used to race triathlons with him. And then he had this accident, and they did a full shoulder replacement. And I was always wondering how these work. Uh, so what we did is we did uh, a motion x-ray of a complete shoulder replacement. And if you want to see another highlighting alteration of normal motion segment integrity, but this is the shoulder, pretty interesting to look at. I hope there's no noise, but if there is, I'm going to let play through. And this is bionic. So this is the head of the humerus. This is the glenoid fossil. And as he's rotating it in and out, how that is actually rotating. This is how it's gone into the uh, humerus. This is the head of the humerus, the artificial. And this is him moving his arm right over here and how this thing is sitting inside that joint. And it just, it amazed me that this thing doesn't constantly uh, sublux right out. I mean, he has to be careful with activity, but he's actually pretty functional. Here he's able to lift his arm pretty high, brings it down. He's able to, amazing to go through full, just about full abduction and bring it down. And the fact that this works astounded me. Yeah, he does have some shoulder pain, uh, but the fact that he's actually as functional as he is, and what I did is I took him through every range of motion because I was curious how this thing really works and how it was the glenoid was uh, anchored and how the head of the humerus worked inside of here. Now, I'm going to kind of digress a little bit. Okay. Digital motion x-ray is the only way to look at um, things for a spinal perspective functionally because it's mo it's motion there's no questioning the motion it's either it's either there or it's not there it's either a lot or it's a little either it's very very subtle or it's really really blatant if a person is moving and you see some subtle uh, changes within movement that you probably wouldn't see on a static uh, what happens is it hurts uh, because their pain, they, they're fighting having the study done because it hurts and they're going to go, they're going to move to a certain degree and they're going to literally bounce back because it hurts. But when you see that kind of increase in um, mobility or hypermobility or laxity in that joint, it's indicating that the ligament has been damaged. And the reason you're not going to see it uh, on a static flexion or a static x-ray is because they're, they're just not going to hold their head in that position in order to take the view because it, it hurts. They're going to move as much as they can to the point of, the, of their tolerance. By the time you shoot the film, they've already shifted. Uh, that's kind of the way motion works. The only other uh, testing that, that I know of that is functionally based, uh, which you can't fake, is uh, I guess it's the other thing that I do as a, as a chiro neurologist is I do a, a lot of uh, EMGs, NCDs. 
And if you have denervation or there's uh, an injury to uh, a nerve and you, you see what they call um, denervation or uh, fibrillation of uh, positive shock waves, the nerve's been injured. It's, and it's fairly uh, new uh, because it really shouldn't be there. And if it was, and if it was re uh, it wouldn't be there, it would show differently. So that's functional. If you're doing something and there's an entrapment of the medium nerve, carpal tunnel, either the nerve uh, velocity has slowed or the amplitude is down or you, you're, uh, you have both. And then if you stick a needle into, let's say for the, the carpal tunnel into your, your, um, into your hand and there's denervation and you end up with atrophy in your hand, same way you evaluate elbow problems uh, using um, nerve conduction and EMG. I'm going to open it up to the floor. If anybody has any questions, I've kind of been through all of my slides. Hopefully, I've been um, you know, helpful to give you a little bit of education of how digital motion x-ray works and how uh, functionally beneficial it is to validating an injury. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Bradkin. Uh, do you want to stop screen share while we have the rest of our discussion? And then I guess if we need to go back to anything, if anybody wants to see it, we can absolutely do that. Um, okay. So we have one other question from our audience and that is how much C1-2 slippage is considered significant? And do you have any research to support that number? When I look at it, uh, I'm, I, after looking at so many, I look at symmetry as, uh, as more important than so much millimeters. Uh, when you start seeing something slipping more than three millimeters, uh, you know you, we have an issue. Um, if you have one or two millimeters, but one side stays perfectly aligned and the other side is um, hypermobile, uh, it's my suspect that the ligament has been stretched and basically radiographically, I kind of associate that the same way I do with uh, EMG. Person has pain, you should have somewhat symmetry left to right. If there's a 50% difference between your right and left side, that's a lot. Uh, so uh, clinically, uh, I pretty much make that uh, determination. And that's kind of looking at, I don't know, I've lost count of how many studies I've looked at mm -hmm. to make that assessment. And in terms of the research, I don't think there's that much written up. I would imagine that any slippage would be a, a concern just because that's, it's not normal, right? It's an objectively abnormal finding unless there was something, I guess, from before that you compare it to, like it was some kind of, you know, something they'd had before. Yeah. I mean, the other things that might, that might cause slippage, which always you, you evaluate for is, you know, because you develop ligament damage, if they had rheumatoid, if they had rheumatoid arthritis, they could have some ligament issues. And once again, you're looking for uh, instability. And uh, I do these studies on people with rheumatoid, you know, which are non-traumatically related studies. You know, all my studies aren't strictly um, because of whiplash injuries. Uh, these are things I do in the, the office routinely. So I'll look at people with rheumatoid and uh, look at left and right side and say, you know, I don't see a lot here. They're really not unstable. Mm -hmm. So you look at enough normals and look at people with pathology other than traumatic pathology. Uh, and you say, okay, I've seen this stuff clinically enough to say there's something going on here. Right. Uh, that's pretty much the way I kind of look at all that stuff. That makes sense. Well, Dr. Brodkin, where can we find someone who uses this kind of technology near us since our audience is all over the country? Uh, what, in Washington? It, anywhere, in, anywhere in the country. Because our audience is from all over, from Georgia to California to New York to any, everywhere in between. I don't know who has motion x-ray units. Okay. Uh, and... Um, you know, uh, the guy who manufactures it, I think it's DMX Works. I mean, you best off contact him and who has uh, motion x-rays. I know there are some people in Fort Myers, guys who, uh, somebody in, in Colorado, because I, 
I've done a bunch of studies for Doc in Colorado um, that uh, he does either PRP or prolotherapy, and these people uh, were living in South Florida, so they came to me to do the study, and then he was going to determine after looking at the study uh, whether he thought they'd been of benefit from what the procedures that he's doing. And these are some people who didn't want to go out to Colorado to first have it done. So they figured, well, here's the study. I'll send it to him, you know, with my read. I said, you know, he's doing it in Colorado. So I know there's somebody in Colorado does it. I know people on the West Coast, Fort, uh, Fort Myers and Tampa have a machine. Um, I know there's somebody in um, New Mexico, uh, I think Las Cruces uh, has a machine. Um, I don't know um, anybody else who really has it. Those are the, kind of the, the people that uh, I've been, you know, communicative with uh, that have uh, been, been doing the studies that I've done studies for. Uh, but other than that, don't know. Okay, so it's just something we should ask for, I suppose, now that we know about it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you, yeah for any soft tissue injuries to not get a, uh, a DMX done, because if the disc is damaged, uh, the fact that the, you, get, you look at whether the, the posterior, you get a disc herniation, the posterior longitudinal ligament sits up against the disc. Uh, so if you're going a, a kind of a, a central herniation, even when you have lateral herniations, posterior lateral, you're pushing back into the, the uh, ligament. So well, if you have a disc herniation, but you're not necessarily getting a, a radiculopathy, you just have pain. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a good chance because of the sensory innovation from the ligament, it's causing pain mm -hmm. uh, because you're, you're firing off those sensory uh, receptors in uh, that ligament. And you, you, one of the, the things that sit up in the, the um, cervical spine, sit in the lumbar spine too, is with ligament damage, you also have your autonomics, uh, your sympathetic autonomics that sit and communicate with all of that. And your autonomics, your sympathetic autonomics will kind of um, amplify injury because they're firing off the same way the ligaments firing off and they keep, it's a feedback system. So you keep firing off these receptors, they keep firing off the sympathetic autonomics. Well, it becomes more and more hypersensitive. So somebody's complaining of a lot of pain. Well, you can't measure how much of those autonomics are really being irritated to feed back, to make him much more sensitive than somebody else who doesn't have that firing going on. Okay. Um, and you can see that with motion. So now I know I have abnormal motion. Also know what's sitting in the neighborhood. Right. Well, that was fascinating to see, right? Even with that fusion and how there was that piece that was moving around, you would not have been able to see that just by going back and checking with the static x-ray. I mean, that person could be complaining about something and they could be doing follow-up x-rays and the doctor could be like, this person is nuts. There's nothing wrong. But if you see it move, that's when you find the solution. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's super interesting because we often have patients who complain of pain and providers are searching and searching with traditional methods, whether it be MRI or x-ray or just visually looking at range of motion or measuring it and they can't figure it out. And so they blame it on malingering or, you know, sort of a fixation disability type thing. So this is really, really fascinating to me. I love this. I think this is so interesting. And I had no idea that it was a tool that we can use because this objective stuff is so important for not only, you know, the insurance company when they're wanting to know, well, what's really wrong with your client, but showing a jury. So Dr. Brodkin, tell us about any time you have testified or used this technology in trial. Um, it's captivated the, the, I think the judge and jury. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to look at it and to be able to see the abnormal motion, it's, it's visual. You know, once you, you see what's abnormally going on, it's kind of when I showed uh, the anterior longitudinal ligament damage, when she went backwards, you just start fall backwards. Mm -hmm. Once you see it, after the ligament's been damaged, you're the radiologist now. That hurts. If I have a bad sprain and a permanent sprain, every time I step on that, that hurts. I'm 
And when it's something in your neck, uh, well, every time you move in your head, oh, that's tight, so I don't really want to move. Mm -hmm. And you start having all this chronic pain. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you have to be able to move because movement helps relieve pain, but too much movement causes pain. Right. Uh, right. So uh, when people say, well, they're hypomobile or a little bit of loss of range of motion, maybe there's some place where they're just hypermobile, ligament damage, the laxity. And when we looked at that girl visually and she had that uh, anterior and posterior longitudinal ligament uh, injury, when you looked at her, her range of motion was astounding if we didn't see that motion x-ray. Mm -hmm. Look at her visually. Only thing she's telling you is it hurts. Mm -hmm. I can tuck my chin. I can look. I have full range of motion. Mm -hmm. But you're you're, you're a little too mo uh, hypermobile, right? And then that yeah, and that demonstrates the fact that you've got a ligament that is stretched out. And we have to, sometimes we'll talk about ligaments being like rubber bands. If you stretch them too far, they no longer kind of have that elasticity. And so it has to be made up as you discussed earlier by your muscles jumping in and playing more than they really should be, which causes kind of a domino effect of all kinds of different issues in that, in that neck. And it looked like you can use this on kind of any joint, any part of the body. Am I understanding that correctly? You, we saw the shoulder, we saw the elbow, we saw the cervical spine. You mentioned the hip. Can it kind of be used all over? Can't do lumbar spine. Oh, interesting. Okay. And the reason it can't do, I don't shoot enough radiation to penetrate the lumbar spine. Okay. Uh, so it, it's the, I don't, there's not enough uh, horsepower to penetrate into the lumbar spine, unless somebody's really, really, really lean. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you know, some, some women who are really lean, I can get enough, if I collimate tight enough, I can see the lumbar spine, I can see movement in there. But if somebody has any kind of girth to them, a uh, male who's musculature, I'm not penetrating uh, through that muscle. I just don't shoot enough horsepower. Okay. Is there anything that can achieve kind of the same idea for that area of the body? Unfortunately, not that I know of, where to be able to see it dynamically. Um, and, you know, fortunately, when you do a hip, it's on an angle. So you're not getting all that, all that muscle in the way. The only thing you're getting pretty much is a little bit of the psoas muscle, which is covering a little bit of the tendons from your, your thigh muscles. Uh, so you can penetrate into the hip. Uh, but if I came over a little bit to look, look the lumbar spine, where you have all of your, basically your bowel, your abdominal muscles, it's just, uh, unfor I wish I could. Yeah. And I've tried and tried and it just, I, I have a couple of, you know, thin women who we've done it, uh, but that's not something that you can really count on. Okay. All right. Well, for most other areas though. So that's, that's awesome. All right, everyone. I've got to cut it off today because I have to head to another meeting. So thank you so much, Dr. Brodkin. And thank you to all of you who joined us for this week's episode of Fridays with Keenan's Cutting Edge. If you liked today's episode, please click that thumbs up button to feed the YouTube algorithm. And don't forget to subscribe and sign up for alerts so you don't miss an episode. Next week, we have KTI's own Amy Gibson, and David Wiley out of Dallas, Texas. David and Amy are incredible trial lawyers and I consider them friends as well. Their forte is employment law. So any of you who practice employment law or know anyone who does, you need to know Amy and David. They have encountered some difficult judges and venues in their practice where they've had to try cases that many lawyers wouldn't even bother to take. And they've been massively successful in doing it. If we spend time blaming judges or juries for our failures, we will never grow because judges and juries only respond to what we present to them. So I wanted Amy and David to come on the podcast, to encourage all of us that we can do well in jurisdictions we are afraid of. It is in our power to communicate effectively to every kind of judge and jury. So I look forward to learning how from Amy and David next week with all of you. Have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you next time.